Welcome, lovers of God and those loved by God. Glad you are here today. Glad to be here with you today. We pull up this morning in our third study from Psalm 23 and the life lessons from this particular chapter of six verses. We have already studied the first two verses and we're looking at this psalm, very familiar of all the psalms, the 23rd psalm. We are looking at this psalm in the English of the old King James, since that is most readily known. And the first couple of verses read, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. We've looked at those verses. But this particular psalm is so powerful, it has such a powerful message, that if we will put it into practice, it will change our lives for the better. The troubled are given peace by it. The sick find it to be medicine for their soul. And the faint of heart are refreshed by it. For they are words of power and simplicity. So today we explore new ground in verse 3. The scripture says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We are to pursue righteousness. And for the honor of his name, God leads us in paths of righteousness. And so verse 3 is about having a godly direction in our life. And I would suggest that this verse is about purpose and power. God wants us to live with purpose. But a purpose that extends beyond this life. He, He wants us to live with power. He wants us to experience power. But a power that enables us to make our break against sin. And pursue the paths of righteousness. This verse is about how God can take a life that is going going pretty much nowhere. Certainly not productive, spiritually speaking. And how God can turn that around and lead them to some place that is spiritually healthy. For His name's sake. The Apostle Paul told Timothy over in 1 Timothy chapter 6. In about verse 30, he says, Timothy, there are people out there who do not hold the sound instruction of the Lord. They do not hold to the truth of the gospel. They do not hold to that which is healthy or sound. They do not hold to godly teaching. And he went on to tell Timothy, and Timothy is a young man. He's being trained by Paul uh, to be a preacher, uh, to be a minister or share of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he looks at Timothy in about verse 11, 10 and 11. He says, Timothy, you're a man of God. He says, you flee from all this. From all this, meaning all this that has to do with not sound doctrine. You flee this. He says, you pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and endurance. And we understand, even he goes on to say, pull all that together and then you be gentle. He says, you, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. He says, take hold of the life. And we know the life is in Jesus. He says, take hold of the life, the eternal life, which is in Christ Jesus, to which you were called. Eternal life is God's purpose for us. Eternal life is what God wants for us. And he has the power to make it a reality. So David says here in the psalm, His shepherd restored his soul. That statement has to do with more than life that is known in the physical realm. It goes deeper. It takes us to the depth of purpose that allows us to see beyond the materialistic life of what we can see with our eyes and touch with our hands. God has the power to pick us up when we are down. And to restore life within us to that individual who has lost their life in sin. And by the way, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all need to be picked up and set on the road to the path of righteousness. As I was thinking about the purpose and power that I see tied within these verses, I was thinking how beautiful it is, how beautiful it is that when we line up our purpose with His purpose, That's when life becomes abundant life. 
That's when we have life to the full. The purpose that gets us out of life's rut in the first place is, is God's intent to save us. And once we are saved and, and we're brought up and we're cleansed of our sins through the blood of Christ, when we're baptized into Christ, united with Christ in His death, which is important because that's where the blood that frees us uh, was shed, so we get in contact in that baptism into His death, that blood, Revelation 1 verse 5, that frees us from sin, because that's what does it, that sinless blood. We know at that point, once saved, we have responsibility. We have to cooperate with God, and, and that is with His purpose. And His purpose is eternal. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. He made that eternal purpose possible through faith in Christ. Our world is filled with hopelessness. That's not a good thing, not to have hope. But our world is filled with hopelessness. A world is trying to, to move God out, to kick God out of places, to kick God out of the schools, and, and Satan's trying to kick God out of our homes, and Satan's trying to kick God out of everyday life. We who believe, on the other hand, have, a, have an assignment to stand up in the midst of all that, in the midst of the hopelessness, in the midst of the, the downhearted. We have the responsibility and the privilege, by the way, to lift high the cross of Christ, to let people know there is hope in Christ, and it is in God's purpose we find that hope. And we can extend that hope to others by pointing them to our Lord Jesus Christ when they're running on empty in the void of eternal life. God's wants, desires to restore our souls. And He has the power to do it, but we have a responsibility in the equation. We can't restore our soul. We can't save ourselves from sin. But we are responsible for listening to the Good Shepherd. We are responsible for obeying by faith the Good Shepherd. We are responsible in living the Christian life with God's help. And we are responsible for allowing Jesus to lead us in paths of righteousness. And we learn about His righteousness in the paths by being in the Word of God. We are responsible for putting our faith in Christ and incorporating His purpose. You know, His purpose is going to be there. Our purpose needs to line up with His purpose. And we need to incorporate His purpose and power into our lives. We are told in the New Testament that we are to work out our salvation. It's an interesting passage. Let me read a couple verses where we see that idea. We see it in other places, but Paul is very clear about it in Philippians chapter 2, in verse 12, beginning. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, <clears throat> they were faithful, they were consistent, uh, they had lined up with Paul and been a partner, partner for the gospel of Christ from the very first day. He talks about that in chapter 1. And then he says, Continue to work out your salvation. Now it's really important to note that he didn't say work for your salvation. Uh, faith works, of course. Faith is active. But we can't earn our salvation. But we can work out our salvation. We're responsible. And he says with fear and trembling. And then this beautiful passage in verse 13. For it is God, he says, who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. That's God's purpose. God wants to work in us. And that word work there in the original language, uh, translated by the word energio, is where we get our English word energy. God wants to be the energy driver in our lives. But we have a responsibility to follow Christ. God will give us the power as we look to Him, as He leads us, as we listen to Him, if we will follow Christ. He will give us the power to be victorious in our Christian life. But we have a responsibility to follow Christ and pursue the paths of righteousness. All right. Back to Psalm 23. I have really three main points. The shepherd can get us back on our feet. 
In my study of sheep, in the sheep shepherd metaphor, I learned something else recently. A sheep, on occasions, will sometimes get turned over on their back, and they can't get up. Now, while this can happen to any sheep, it especially happens to the sheep prior to giving birth. Because the sheep as well has some extra weight. And the sheep will lie down and, 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 and sleep, and then when it goes to get up, it struggles and sometimes can't get up. And it has, you know, frantically uh, trying to get up, but it's not able to get up. Literal shepherds describe such a scene as a sheep having an anxiety attack. It's interesting, as I was reading about that, shepherds say that in this condition, when the sheep is frantically trying to get up, they tend not to make any noise. They don't really moan. They just, in their panic, they just have this frustration within themselves. And you can see it. And, and it looks like an anxiety attack. And in their frightened frustration, if a shepherd doesn't arrive in time, a sheep can actually die in their panic. That's interesting. So obviously shepherds are always on the lookout for fallen sheep. And, and, and they say that, uh, well, as you can imagine, they're not the only ones on the lookout for fallen sheep. Coyotes and all kinds of predators obviously understand a fallen sheep is very easy prey. The falling down can happen to us in a spiritual sense. We sometimes fall, and we need help getting up. And even if we have the desire to get back up, which hopefully we have that desire to get back up, we still need help. We can't restore our soul. We can't forgive ourselves of sin. We need God's help. But sometimes we act foolishly, and we act like we can handle things, and we refuse to reach out for God to help. And when we do that, things only get worse if we have fallen down spiritually. Now we're in a situation where we can't get up, can't get out of, and of course we find ourselves with sin having that, you know, entangled us or took a hold of us, and, and, and we have that battle going on. Our shepherd, the Lord, wants to restore our soul. And he's out looking for us. Um, Dan mentioned that in class this morning about the story there. Uh, of the prodigal son. But in the first part of that chapter, in Luke chapter 15, the first few verses, you have the shepherd out looking for that one sheep that has wandered off. And if we will look, be looking for the shepherd, if we will listen to the shepherd and we'll be willing to obey the shepherd, our shepherd wants to. He desires to restore our soul. And then in that prodigal story, son, a uh, story, we often talk about that story in about verse 7, uh, down to maybe verse 40, in that ballpark, in Luke chapter 15, about the story of the prodigal son. We usually say it's a story of the prodigal son, but really it's, the, it's God the, is the hero in the story. God is the hero. And you find in that story that uh, when, the, when the father found his son, he came home. He held him close. And that's what the shepherd does when he finds his sheep because he's so excited. He rejoices because he's found that which was lost. In the story of the prodigal son, father representing God, the father is the hero. Listen to Luke chapter 15 and verse 20. So he got up. And the prodigal went to his father because he came to his senses over his sin. He knew he needed to return to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. That means he was looking for him. And he was filled with compassion for him. He was moved. And he ran to his son. Threw his arms around his son and kissed him. And of course, they did have a feast. And he rejoiced. But do not read lightly over the words he ran. God runs. When we need help, when we need to reach out to God, God is looking for us, and God wants to help us. And while we can't do what God can do, because only God can do what He can do, and we need God, we need the shepherd, there are some things that we can do 
even for others in these difficult times. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, verse 24, that we are to consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And then in verse 25, it says, Let us not give up in meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. And I've seen a form of refreshment like this happen again and again. And I think you have too. I've seen parents go through the most difficult times we can imagine. And I've seen a family, the family of God, rally around those parents. And, and he's going to talk about this in, in the song, in the, the valley of death. I've seen parents go through those times in their valley of death and how God's people has rallied around them and have refreshed their soul in, in, their, in, their, in their most difficult times. And they continue to follow the path of righteousness. I've known couples who have fallen down in their marriages. Now God has brought restoration back into their homes. I've seen fathers who have fallen down with their families. Believers who have fallen down morally. in Situations that looked absolutely hopeless until they called out for Jesus and repented of their sin. And Jesus picks them up, stood them upright in an upside down world. The shepherd restores our soul. The shepherd seeks to rescue every sheep because they're worth it. No matter how we feel, God says we're worth it. And He seeks us out. And He will not give up on us because He loves to restore souls. He loves to help struggling sheep. David said, He leadeth me in paths he guides me in paths of righteousness. Here's the second thing we can take away from the song. The shepherd will keep us moving in the right direction. That's important. Remember, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. Something else I learned about sheep. Sheep have a limited vision. I mean, all sheep have a limited vision. They're nearsighted, and they cannot see more than about 15, maybe 20 yards ahead of them. And so I learned that, and as you can imagine, if you, a sheep happens to wander off, which they are prone to do, it's difficult for them sometimes to even get back to the flock on their own. They only know what's in front of them. So... Maybe there's application here for us as well. It's difficult for a literal sheep to plan way out in the future because they can't see, they don't visualize. They can't imagine, of course. Isaiah 48 verse 17 reads, This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. We need a shepherd. It's an interesting metaphor of God's people because we too, in a sense, have limited vision. This is why we tend to focus on the immediate as if it's the most important. And we need, we need a shepherd because some things, sometimes we are absolutely oblivious to where the short vision span of ours is taking us in the long haul. We need a shepherd. The Lord helps us to see the path that keeps us from neglecting our family, from neglecting our spiritual life. And I want to encourage all of us to keep putting the Lord in our close-range vision, but keep our eyes on Him so we can see the future and look. Look, heaven is a motivator. Heaven is a real place. Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. It's okay to think about heaven. In fact, we need to be thinking about heaven. And, and God wants us to think about heaven. Because that is where He's directing us. He's guiding our steps in the right direction. And so when David said, He leads me in paths of righteousness, he was saying God gives him direction in life. God gives him a long-range purpose to pursue. And each 
step each day that we listen to the Lord, we read the Word, we pray to God. The Shepherd is leading us, and He's leading us to heaven. Isaiah wrote, in Isaiah 53, verse 6, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Why? Because left to our own. That's what sheep do. Literal sheep are prone to wander off. They're prone to fall. They're prone to make mistakes. We find ourselves at times in the midst of all that. Asking the question, does God care? Does God care? And when we look back at the cross, we know the answer to the question with an exclamation point. We know that Jesus came to this earth with a purpose to saving the lost, seeking and saving the lost. We know that he went to the cross with his sinless blood that was shed. We know that no one took his life from him. He gave it up on his own accord, John chapter 10, verse 17, verse 18. And we know that that blood that, that, is, that is, was sinless makes possible the cleansing of our sin. We know three days later he comes forth from a tomb to proclaim, Romans 1-4, that he was indeed the Son of God with the exclamation point. And we look at all that, and, and even at a glance of that, we can know that God cares. God is our caring he is our tender. He is our loving. He is our guiding shepherd. David used the phrase, phrase, He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. <clears throat> we know the shepherd will use us to make a difference in the world. In our world, as small as our world may be, for His glory. The shepherd, we know, number one, can get us back on our feet. Number two, the shepherd can get us in the right direction. And number three, the shepherd, the shepherd will use us for His glory. The phrase, for His name's sake, appears multiple times in the Scripture. For example, David himself in Psalm 106, verse 8, said this, God save them for His name's sake to make His mighty power known. The phrase means God does something so that people will know something. And what He wants them to know is that He is God, that He is the Lord, He is the Creator, and He wants the world to know Him so that they can Enjoy His eternal purpose for them. For His name's sake. The phrase, know that I am the Lord, is found over 700 times in the Scripture. When, when the Scripture says, I want you to know I'm the Lord, God wants you to know that He's the Lord for a reason. And the reason is, He is the shepherd who cares. He's the shepherd who seeks the lost. He's the shepherd who runs to, to embrace those who come home. In the book of Ezekiel, at least, at least 63 times, in the book of Ezekiel, God will do something. And the prophet Ezekiel will say, God did this so that you may know He is the Lord. The idea is for His name's sake. God wants to work in our lives for His name's sake so that people will know God, so that people will come to know Jesus Christ. God wants to use us according to His good purpose to help change not only our lives, but to help influence others for the, for, to make change for the better for eternity. I love this verse came across it in a, in a new way in my study of David in, in recent months. But it's in Acts chapter 13. Let me read the verse. For when David, Acts 13 verse 36, 
For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and was buried with his fathers. David lined up his purpose with God's purpose because God had a purpose for his life. And God has a purpose for our lives. And, and that purpose is eternal. It's an eternal purpose that He wants us to be with Him. I pray that God will be able to say that in our life. When we fall asleep and fall asleep in Jesus. That He or she fulfilled His purpose. God's purpose in His generation. This week's challenge involves three things. Memorize or meditate or both in this particular verse. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteous for his name's sake. Secondly, practice what I call spiritual breathing. If sin creeps in, and sin is always trying to creep in our hearts, and and for a moment we lose our balance, and, and maybe even if we fall, don't have an anxiety attack. Cast your anxiety, 1 Peter 5, verse 7, on the Lord. Because that's what He wants. Go to Jesus. Ask God to forgive you of your sin. Let Him put you back on your feet and restore your soul. And third, begin each day. This week, begin each day with a request for guidance. that to help. Ask God to help you follow the path of righteousness. That will open your eyes to to maybe opportunities to help people that you come in contact with in a new way. Letting God lead us in paths of righteousness begins with us obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Good Shepherd. Yes, He's a Good Shepherd. He can remove our guilt. He can take away our sin. He can restore our soul. Forgive us all of our trespasses. and, And we ask... Why wouldn't you want to follow Him? How do we get forgiveness from God? We have to believe that He is God. We have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah. The one who came, who was able to give up His life on the cross that was sinless. So that He could relate to us. And yet... Understand in that relating, he still had no sin. And then because of that, understand that when we listen to his word, he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life eternal. And so I ask you this morning, have you made the conscious decision? Because I know some are thinking about doing this, and many of us have, but Have you made the conscious decision to fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author, the Bible says, and the perfecter of our faith, by being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sin? At which time God forgives us, at which time God fills us with the indwelling of the Spirit, at which time God cleanses us, in fact, puts us in that realm where every spiritual blessing is found is in Christ, Ephesians 1, verse 3. This morning, if you need to respond in a public way, we pray that you will... Choose to follow the path of righteousness. Won't you come if you need to as we stand and sing?